Hello and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale the Real Seeker. And today I'm having a, a special guest on the show. Um, so in the first list we have David Kemble Cook. Hey, David. Hi there. Welcome back to the show. This is your, your second time, I think, on the show. You're, you're on before talking about eschatology. Right, yes. Awesome. Yes. And, yeah, and, and cool. And uh, helping me out is my fellow Christian co-host, uh, David Russell. Uh, welcome back to the show, David. You've been on many times. Yeah, man, it's uh, I'm no stranger, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. All right, cool. So um, basically the reason I, I'm getting together for the show is there's been a bit of a change. Um, so as listeners will know, David Kemble was um, a biblical Unitarian or in a loose sense, a Christian for a, a very long time. Um, and just recently he's changed his mind. He's deconverted. He, he's now no longer claims to be a Christian in that sense. So uh, one thing I'd like to do just for the audience, let me just turn it straight to you, um, David Kay, and maybe give us kind of an introduction as to who you are, your, your kind of background and your faith journey, um, and then give sort of a summary of to your recent position. Okay, right. Well, thank you, Dale. Uh, yes, I, I'm delighted to be on and, uh, and, and indeed uh, delighted that anyone should be interested enough in me to <laughs> ask me on a podcast. But yes, uh, for myself, I am nearing, uh, nearing 70 years old now. And I been a, a Christian of, of some kind all my adult life. I remember being baptised into the Church of England, well they called it confirmed, confirmed into the Church of England in my early 20s. I had a kind of conversion experience when I was at university and so I became for a while a, a, an evangelical type Christian uh, in, in the Church of England, uh, then was attended the Church of England with varying degrees of commitment over the years uh, until around about age late 30s I was invited along to a, a, a oneness Pentecostal meeting and I had another conversion of a kind of different a different kind <laughs> and for a while I was uh, I was totally taken with the oneness Pentecostal doctrine so are you are you familiar with oneness Pentecostalism Dale yeah yeah yeah, so we know all about um, Jesus being God, as it were, and um, and also there are other kind of doctrines that they have a um, that, that are represented in the states by um, the uh, uh, UPC or the UPCI and um, and the other the, the kind of anyway uh, you, you know you know them well. So they're a very strong movement uh, in the US and and. In the, in the UK, they have quite a lot of churches that are kind of daughter churches, either of the, the churches in the US or in, or in the Caribbean. But anyway, I, I joined a fellowship there and was and for a while um, became part of the UPC and one of the churches in London. And I believe their doctrine for a, for a, for a while, but, uh, but um, it didn't take me long to start questioning things. And, and my, my whole makeup has been out to to, to inquire and to study, you know, that's what I think I've been doing most of my life, is <laughs> kind of studying. I did maths and philosophy at university and I've always had an interest. So it didn't take me long to see through the holes in some of the, the doctrine of uh, oneness Pentecostalism, in, in particular, the, the doctrine that you have to speak in tongues to be saved. And um, so, you know, once you kind of look at that from the outside, you can see I, th I think anyone looking in from the outside would see this is a kind of ridiculous doctrine, <laughs> um, but it has very little biblical warrants. And, and I was very much concerned with biblical truth. You know, I did believe that what was in the Bible is true. And uh, so I was, you know, an inerrantist, if you like, then. And, uh, but so it didn't take me long to realize that, that there wasn't much truth in that doctrine. But then I remained, uh, and I still remain, uh, I'm still fellowship with, a oneness Pentecostal church where near where I live in, in England and, and my wife goes to church as well so you know I'm still as it were nominally part of that organization and and, uh, and you know they're, they're lovely people and, uh, and they call me brother David and, and so I'm still you know nominally part of that assembly but round about I, I started 
writing a book about the Trinity and against the Trinity in the early 2000s. And during the course of that writing and, and my studying, uh, I came to realize that, that um, for salvation, for Christian salvation to, to have any meaning or any effect, Jesus had to be a real human being. He had to have thought and acted and been a, a real human being and not some kind of appearance of God, uh, you know, as it, as it were, as, as, a, as the oneness Pentecostal doctrine implies, which is that the identity of Jesus with God. And so in the course of that writing, I kind of converted myself to Unitarianism. And I, and I studied and I, and I contacted people and I talked to um, quite a few people online, uh, emailing, uh, Christadelphians particularly, and the people in the, uh, the Spirit and Truth organization in the States, which is, uh, used to be called The Way, so I expect you know of them, but they, they authored uh, a fantastic book called One God, One Lord, which is a great tome and really goes into the Unitarian view on scripture and gives very good uh, outlines, summaries, interpretations of all those Trinitarian and deity of Christ verses that, that um, Trinitarians like to go to, you know, to support their doctrine. And, uh, and so that, that was my conversion. So, I, and then I linked up with various Unitarian groups here in, in the States. So I've had that kind of existence for the last 15, 16 or so, 14, 14 years, 15 years, uh, while remaining nominally uh, in, a, in a oneness Pentecostal fellowship. So, yeah, and then, but, but you know, over time, the, the sheer weight of the problems here. I mean, it's that, um, you know, thinking about just, I mean, I was happy with being a Christian and saying, well, I, I'm a liberal Christian. I, I, I started to, you know, I, I was doing a degree in theology, uh, my correspondence. And so that the, the, the idea that the Bible has to be an errant was subject to scrutiny and I realized that I could not longer believe in that and various other things started me along the the movement towards the liberal Christianity if you like you know the liberal attitude to the bible um, and once you let go of the, everything in the bible is true then um, you have a different attitude to scripture and you're thinking well it, you know a lot of this is just a human document it may be inspired but what does that mean so we, we, you know, we, we, we could talk about that as well. You know, I, I think um, the nature of the Bible or attitude to biblical truth um, is really important. And it's one of the, uh, the foundation stones, if you like, or, or, or planks, if you like, which support um, Christian, Christian belief. So, you know, as I said to you before the show, I think the nature of the Bible and, uh, and I had a little, I drew a little diagram for myself where you show um, a horizontal line with um, various positions, you know, so on one side of you, you've got inerrancy and a scale, a scale, that's the word. And then you can move down that toward along the line to, um, to in inspired, you know, and then you, you, at the other end of the scale, you've got the Bible as a human document and and, and so, you know, I found myself moving along that scale away from the inerrancy side uh, towards the way a liberal Christian would, would see it, you know, as the Bible is a human document that in some sense or in some places inspired by God. So, yeah, so in my study in theology, I, I became more liberal, uh, but I still thought of myself as being a Christian. And, and, and uh, I mean, we may disagree and, and it would be good to talk sometime this evening about what is a Christian, you know, how do you define a Christian? But I were quite happy, and all Unitarian Christians are quite happy in calling themselves Christians uh, because they believe in Jesus Christ, his atoning death, that he died for the sins of the world, um, in the world, you know, the life hereafter, um, and so on. So, you know, I, I didn't feel any problem with denying a trinity or denying the deity of Christ. Um, so I, I had a kind of compromise then in that situation. I became, was liberal in my attitude to the Bible, um, believed that Jesus Christ was a human Messiah, 
which, which you know, I still do. He certainly believed he was the Messiah and the disciples thought he was. Um, but all the time, these other problems with Christianity started to emerge and, and I thought and studied, you know, we've got, um, there's the problem of evil, the Bible we've talked about and we've mentioned rather, and, and the picture of God as shown in the Old Testament is, is a real, is a, be, is a bed bug, isn't it? It's a sore. Um, how do you account for these, the genocides, the cruel punishments in the Old Testament laws, the instructions for rape and so on? Uh, all of that was causing a tension. Problem of evil I've mentioned is also the, um, the, the, the God's responsibility for, 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 for evil um, and the sense that God brought evil into the world. If he created it, um, um, if he created everything, he certainly created evil. Um, there's the issue of God's justice as well. If God um, created everyone knowing in advance what they would do, uh, but then condemning those who are not saved for punishment uh, for something that he created them to do, that, that does not seem to be just. So that's uh, another issue, really. We've got the problem of evil, God's justice, all these things were weighing on my mind. Problems with the doctrine of sin and salvation as well. Does it hang together? How do we understand sin? What is sin? What happens? Is there, um, is there, is there punishment for sin? Uh, what about heaven and hell? Uh, salvation and atonement. How does that actually work? Um, having studied it, you know, obviously doing a theology degree, you have to. And you see all the different answers and theories about atonement. And you wonder, I certainly wondered, well, why isn't the New Testament clear about these things? Why isn't the New Testament clear about what someone has to do to achieve salvation? Um, is salvation by faith or, or by works or by works and faith? Or is it by grace alone? And, and of course, all of this, I think, as I began to see that the New Testament was, is inconsistent on these things or incomplete um, and hence all the different schools. And so, you know, as, as we, we see all different schools of thought in Christianity. So Christianity is not clear. You know, the, the, uh, you have the Calvinists, the Arminians um, differ, certainly on the surface, about what, what salvation is and, and how it, what we have to do to achieve it. Questions like, as well as, is, as well as not as well as not being consistent, we can go through passages, you know, biblical passages if you like, but as well as not being consistent, there's also a completeness problem because the, the New Testament does not say anything really about the, the salvation status of people who died before Christ, um, infants who die in childbirth, uh, people with mental disabilities who don't wouldn't understand about Jesus. People even, you know, today who never hear of Jesus, um, do they go to hell or not? The New Testament's not clear. And for a while I was kind of thinking to myself, well, if everyone at the final resurrection has a chance to, to say whether they accept Christ or not, uh, then, then that would make God just. <laughs> so I was happy with that, that kind of compromise for a while. Um, and, I, and I remember Justin Briley, of course, of Unbelievable, whom you know well, um, he actually said the same thing uh, on one of his shows and because he's had a lot of exposure to, um, to you know, opposing points of view. And so he's obviously had to think things out as well and think of how, can, how could God be just when the Bible says this or the, one, the Bible says that or what do we say? So, you know, I, I was feeling uneasy really about, about these kind of issues. Um, there are more, but maybe that's enough to mention for at the moment. And so the thing is that, you know, if you can have, as I was saying to you before, um, you, a Christian is, is somebody who's, we talk about planks as a metaphor for support, on a platform, making up a platform that supports a, a structure of belief. Um, and you can think of it as somebody standing on a platform. So, which is made up of a number of planks. And we, we talk about that as a good metaphor for, for doctrine. And if you remove one of them, then 
you've still got a platform because you can just shift your weight a bit, can't you, and move, move. Um, but then if you remove another one, it becomes a little more tricky to maintain your balance, you know? And, and, uh, and then, so we get to, you know, what happens when one by one, they all go, you know, and, and I, list, I listed to you in my email, say six planks, um, the truth and reliability of the Bible, uh, and the second one, the Christian story, fallen redemption, this kind of arc, you know, overall story, narrative, uh, the fall in, in the Garden of Eden, um, and then redemption, and then second coming, you know, the, the, the eschatological end to all the story. Um, number three, um, the, the, the nature of God, is God good? Is God good? Is God just? You know, is, is, how can we reconcile that with what the Bible says? Um, number four, the resurrection of Jesus, which, you know, might say is a, it's an essential part of Christian belief, is believing that Jesus was raised from the dead. That would be the fourth one. Fifth one, the doctrines of sin and salvation, as what I mentioned before. And, and six, you know, what God answering prayer. I think prayer. Um, does God answer prayer? Because if God doesn't answer prayer, then a lot of the New Testament is 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 incorrect because the New Testament says God answers prayer. Indeed, the whole Bible talks about God answering prayer. Um, and so all of these six were really being taken away, or I was taking them away. So at that point, I, I was last year, no, year before last, I was starting to um, seriously question these things. And I, and I dialogued, I looked online, and uh, I saw some, some videos by ex-Christians, of course, uh, you probably know of Paul Ogier and Pine Creek. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, Mr. Deity as well, who's, who's, who's a laugh. <laughs> But the, all these, these three guys had been there and were Christians and studied and knew their Bibles. And so they were not talking from a position of ignorance at all. And, um, and the things they said made sense to me. I think that if we, we could, the Bible is just unclear about many things. And what it says in one place, it contradicts itself in another place. So, you know, after a while, you can sort of give up trying to hold these things together. So over the course of last year, I, I, I admitted to myself that I just can't do it anymore. I can't do it. Um, I talked to you about 12 things, so that 12 points of difference. Mm -hmm. And when I reached 12, that was a, a bit flippant in a way, but, but the underlying thing I hope you understand is that I just felt it was, impossible for me to be honest with myself and say I'm still a Christian if I don't believe in these six things um, as, as Christian doctrine. Uh, you know, that, that's kind of, you can think of it as also as a scaffolding, as a structure. I don't know if you, have you, uh, either of you seen this film, The Big Short? No, I haven't. No, okay, well it's all about the crash of the stock market in 2008, mm -hmm. which um, I presume you, you remember I, well. Yeah. <laughs> when all the, the, these junk bonds. Um, yeah, I'm old enough realize, to remember, you know. <laughs> yes. You're old enough, yes. <laughs> Even I am. Well, yeah. I, I hope you didn't lose a house or anything. No. Um, no, no. no. I, I wasn't that, that old to have been able to own a house at that point, I don't think. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you, you were well out of it. But... I was just out of, I was just pretty much, uh, well, no, I was, I was out of high school. Uh, well, yeah, it was 2008. I mean, my dad had just passed away. Uh, I was in the workforce. Uh, but yeah, uh, I was, I remember the start of it all when, uh, you know, the housing market was crazy during the Bush years. So yes. we had that recession there too. So you want to go back even further. I mean, we see where, you know, I think, I think that Clinton, Clinton's, economics kind of inflated us to the point where the bubble bursts you know <laughs> yes that's right and, and 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 this bubble housing bubble which of course had shock waves all around the world um was based upon uh, mortgage bonds that were based that were um that were fraudulent they were um billed as so-called triple a mm -hmm. bonds when in fact they were um they were based upon the houses uh, mortgages um, which were given to people who had no way 
who had no um, didn't have enough income to to Bad funding. You know, repay those. Yeah, mortgages. and they had no business giving them out. Yeah. Yeah. No, indeed. And so I, I also I also remember that Bush got a lot of the blame for it. But then, like, I remember listening to his address to Congress telling them that, hey, this is a problem. It's going to blow up soon. And yes. it's like, man, they, they give him the rap, but it's really Congress that that didn't do anything about it. Yeah. So, but awesome. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Or yeah. Sorry. You're, so anyway, you're, yeah, you're the, across the, the pond there. So, <laughs> yes, uh, so, you felt um, it, too. Indeed, of course, we, we absolutely, yeah. and there were other things going on as well. And 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 you know, that my own bank that went went bust basically, the Halifax Bank, it had to be taken over by another bank uh, because yeah. it had abandoned proper lending on mortgages and instead traded on the wholesale finance market day to day, and instead trying to finance itself. So anyway, a lot of things were going wrong. But in this film, The Big Shorts, there's a wonderful scene where um, the, the, the people who are trying to expose this fraud go into a meeting and they have this structure based um, of um, a tall structure, a tower built, built of wooden, wooden chips or slots, like, like dominoes, you know, dominoes um, built. So can, if you can imagine, you know what dominoes are? These little yeah. wooden flats, about say two inches by an inch or something. So it's built like that. Um, and he's saying, this is our financial system and it's built on these. But um, if we start removing, and he started to take away one by one, these, um, what, these dominoes at the base. And then you can see that at that po at certain point, after you've removed a certain number, the whole thing falls down. Sense. And, and, and and of course the like it's like those cards you the houses you build with cards as well or well, i don't but people do you know and then suddenly you take away one of them the whole thing falls down <laughs> and that's what i felt about my christianity there was a sort of turning point um when i started kind of flipped and you know, i thought um I, I i can't really in honesty you know I've, I've taken away too many chips you know too many planks have fallen away um, if you if you take away one or two, then you can kind of hold on to the rest and and say, oh, well, there's disagreement amongst Christians about this and that, you know. So you know, and they're all Christians, so we, we can handle that. But if you start to say, abandon the belief in in the, the Bible's reliable and that the Christian story really does make sense, and that God, as shown in the Bible, is not really good or just, and then there's doubt about the resurrection of Jesus. If you let go of inerrancy, you see, you have a problem, don't you? Because then how do you believe anything in the Bible? Um, how do we know that Jesus was resurrected if we don't have the faith in the first place to believe it's true? Let, um, one thing I want to ask. Oh. We, you might want to come back on that uh, as well. I but, will, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, and, okay, um, so maybe, yeah, like maybe a wrap up, because I, I wanted to ask one um, quick clarification question, a couple of quick clarification questions. So I understand what you're saying here. So like basically for you, um, these dominoes were being taken out and, you know, it was an arbitrary thing. You had this number 12. For, for me, it was 10 um, kind of thing where I studied 10 negative evidences and those were pulled out from under you and basically the whole faith as a whole collapsed. One thing I'm curious about from you and the reason I wanted to have you on would you say that you're still a real seeker? Let's say we could put one of those planks back. Like, are, are you open to coming back to faith if one or more of these issues are solved or, or you hear an answer or, or if you know I've studied it enough, I, I've made, made up my opinion, they don't work or where, where do you fit there? Um, no, yeah, I, I am completely open. Yes, Dale. And uh, uh, is, who is, is that Dale talking with David? Yeah, sorry, that was me, Dale. Yeah, okay, yeah, no, I would be, I would be. And I still consider myself a theist. I still believe in a kind of God, and, and I, still, I still pray. <laughs> and and um, even though I, I have my doubts about whether it has any, you know, um, effect, but um, I still believe that there's a power. Um, and that I'm not a naturalist, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, I, I'm not on that scale at all. Uh, I do believe that there are powers in the world and that there's a, a, some kind of design or creating 
uh, intelligence, uh, and maybe even a moral foundation as well, uh, because I do believe that that um, Christian values change the world. And so I, I'm a theist, and you could say maybe a kind of quasi-Christian theist uh, in that sense. So, but I'm open. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm definitely open. If someone could could um, could could show me or help me um, with one or two of these things. Um, resurrection of Jesus is, you know, is is a, is a good issue there. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm planning to get to that. Um, yeah. yeah, cool. All right. Well, the, the first thing I kind of wanted to ask you about before we get into the issue, some of the issues that you mentioned is methodology. So you've kind of explained that a little bit. And I'm going to get both of you guys take on, on this. Um, so I noticed that a, a lot of your uh, reasons uh, for leaving the faith um, are kind of what I would refer to as negative evidences. There's this problem in the Bible, or there's this problem, you know, there's a problem, and there's a reason to disbelieve that it's true. Um, in the first place, ha has anything in terms of the positive end, and this this might get into the resurrection of Jesus a bit, but mm. the, the positive evidence in favor of Christianity, has that changed at all? Has that weakened, or do you think that has anything changed on the positive end, like, you know, the evidence for the resurrection or whatever positive reasons you had for believing Christianity was true? Well, I think, I think, um, you know, um, Doug of Pine Creek, he makes a very good point. Do, do you listen to um, his, his videos? I've, I've heard a bunch of them. Yeah, but yeah me too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I've, right. No. So we're familiar. He makes, very, he makes a very good point. I mean, he's sympathetic, really, you know, um, to to many aspects here, having been in that position. And he's saying, really, you know, if you've got, you can divide the Christians um, today into two groups, those that have an experience in their lives and those that haven't. And if you've had an experience in your life, you know, if you've seen something, if you've seen a miracle, if you've had a miracle happen to you, if you've been healed or your family member has been healed after prayer, you know, uh, then, you've got a different kind of faith from someone who hasn't. So does that make sense to you? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I think it's a good point because he's saying, he, you know, he, he will say, and I, I think he's right, is that those who've had that experience in their life, that's what they hold on to. That's their foundation. And they can fit everything else around that in a way. You know, they could, cut, could, they could handle some of the other planks being removed because they've got, they've got this really big plank. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> which is Thanks. nailed on, which is nailed on, holding them up. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. So, so that's what I was, you got exactly what I was asking, because yeah. for, for me, what holds up my faith in terms of my methodology is, so I had four positive evidences. One was, you know, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, that experiential, experiential one. The other was the evidence for the resurrection, which we'll, we'll get to, um, Additionally, there was what I called the vindication argument, um, and then there was the shroud of shroud of Turin. Um, but then on the there was also negative evidence. So I, I was about ninety five percent certain that Christianity was false, based on some of the negative evidences, or at least that's what I assumed as a default um, prior to considering the positive evidences. And then I kind of weighed it overall to come out to well, what's you know, what's more probable than not? Is Christian, do these positive evidences outweigh the negative ones or the opposite? Do the negative ones outweigh? And I would determine belief that way. So yeah, I just wanted to get your guys' take on like kind of making an overall judgment. And I'll, I'll ask both of you, how, how do you guys fit all of these elements together to make sort of an overall judgment? Um, what was your, Dale, what was your third one? Holy Spirit, uh, witness, Resurrection, Shroud of Turin was number four, was it? Yeah, uh, and there's the Vindication. What? Vindication, vindication what, what's that? You're number three. So that one is, it's basically a, an argument from uh, fulfilled prophecy almost. It's, it's that Jesus predicted he would be vindicated in, in an extraordinary way. And then that's conditional upon, well, can you prove the resurrection? Can you prove the Shroud evidence? So there was this extraordinary vindication. Okay. Well, thanks. Yeah. 
Yeah, no worries. Um, okay. Yeah, da David R. Maybe I'll I'll turn it to you because you like. Yeah. What do you make of this methodological point of how do we? Okay, so maybe we've got these problems on the negative side and we don't know a solution to them, but on the other hand, we do have positive reasons for believing. How how do we put this together? Yeah, Dale, this was really good. And you know, David, you actually said some things that just that that piqued my curiosity too. And and maybe you can like uh, get into them as well. It, you, you know, you, you did have issues with the Bible being inconsistent and this and that, but uh, and how Christians can't agree on this and that and what it is to be a Christian. I mean, you said a lot there, but it seems that that you seem to see some of these essentials, you know, that that these essentials do pop out. So that would like tell me that you see some sort of clarity, but, you know, maybe and here's and this is what helped me is that like. I had those obvious negative uh, uh, evidences that that hit me too, and those doubts and those questions that hit me too. But once I did form a methodology to kind of like categorize and put these into sense to to make sense, because like I was the type of person that would listen, study, and then another question would come up, right? And I didn't develop the whole positive side. I would basically view it as a contrarian. That would, uh, you know, deal with the objections more as they came versus developing my own systematic and saying, OK, these are great positive evidences. Let's see now how these evidences, these negative evidences weigh and what is more probable. So, yes, Dale, like when you say that, you know, the witness of the Holy Spirit is very important to you, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's huge. Some people don't have that. So what, what else can you have? in the positive camp to examine with the negative, because I do think that there's these, uh, I do think there's a ton of positive evidence for Christianity and I, I don't hear David and I've never heard a pol uh, apology. I think he's more, he's more skilled in his rhetoric. Uh, and I think Pine Creek is also very good at, 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 you know, talking and, and breaking things down, but they, they, they haven't said anything new, you know, against the faith. And I still find all those things more problematic on an unbeliever side versus a believer side. So what I did, like I said, is I developed a systematic uh, of um, not just positive evidences, but like I would say neutral evidences too. that that, you know, things that that, that just make more sense. If if the Christian God even arises, you know, so I like I said, I, I look at I look at my faith as 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 putting together a puzzle, you know, and you got to put the pieces where they fit, you know, and, uh, you know, the evidences uh, fulfill a mosaic or a tapestry or or uh, a a a picture, you know, and I think that that picture says that Christianity is true more and is more probable and explains my experiences, explains my reality than uh, any of those negative evidences. And there's another thing, too, is, is that I understand that there's problems with things that we read in the Bible. Um, but I, I've never really been one to, like, jump totally in the negative. I try to, like, open my mind to say, you know what, there's some things that I'm not going to understand. So before I go saying this doesn't make sense – let me see if there's something I'm missing historically. And if if there's something that I'm going to have to say, I don't know about, you know, uh, and maybe we haven't found that. Maybe we haven't discovered that, you know, or maybe it was lost in the in the in the pages of history, you know, or in the in the time, you know, in, in, in time, you know. So that's kind of like, I, I guess, my answer in a nutshell, Dale. Gotcha. All right. Perfect. Kind of like a, yeah, I, I like that. So kind of like an abductive approach there. So yeah, uh, David, David Kemble, obviously you're the, the main guest here. So I, I wanted to put that to you. Like how, how do you take these, these bits, these po positive reasons to believe if you had any, I'm, I'm assuming you had any when you were a Christian yeah. and then weigh that against all of these 12 negative considerations. How do you put that together to say overall the structure can't stand? Yeah, exactly. Um, I can just put down a marker here is that we're all talking about Christianity and being a Christian is like one thing, which is easy to define. Um, so 
so we, we, we I think we want to put a marker there because cool. um, there are many, you know, how do we define being a Christian here? Oh, you know, what, what are the essentials there? At one point, you know, do I decide I'm not a Christian? Uh, and then previously last week I wasn't, I was, and now um, it's, 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 it's something that, you know, needs to fish and obviously people argue about what it is to be a Christian, you know, what, what the essentials, what you have to believe. Um, but yeah, positive evidences. Now there were two things I, 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 I felt the Holy Spirit quite a few times in my life. Um, but then, you know, thinking now, if, if we have an experiences which we believed at the time were the Holy Spirit, um, then these are consistent with other types of, it doesn't mean that it followed from that, that Jesus had to be raised from the dead, the fact that I had certain experiences um, at all. It doesn't follow logically from that. Um, there may indeed, there may have been genuine experiences of being um, influenced or, or addressed or talked to by a, a deity of some kind, but it doesn't follow from that, that this deity is the God of the Bible. Gotcha. Or that Jesus rose from the dead. If you, I hope you take my point there. Yeah. Is that yeah. just because we have certain experiences, uh, it's not legitimate. So that's the conclude. Therefore, Christianity must be true. Yeah. Uh, in, in all, you know, in, 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 uh, uh, therefore the creed, it must be correct. Uh, but I did have two, two experiences and, and uh, sort of these remarkable type um, coincidence type experiences, you know, where we, 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 you could, if you divide miracles into natural miracles and supernatural miracles, these were natural miracles, is that I, I, I had a, a pocket Bible and I lost it. And, and, and then uh, I, I was cycling through High Park one day on the way to work or back from work or sometime. It must have been another time, but anyway, uh, I got to Hyde Park Corner, where you know, you know, uh, no, sorry, Speaker's Corner, you know, where where Marble Arch is and and where the people stand up and you know address people and so on. There's a great meeting place, and I sat down by the fountain and I just got to talking with a guy, and I just happened to mention that I'd lost my Bible. Um, I don't know why, and then he he showed me this Bible he had. Is this you mean this one? He had it. He had my Bible, and um, and which is amazing. Um, obviously, I got it back from him. And then um, another time, we had a youth camp. This is our Pentecostal church. We had a youth camp on the Isle of Wight, and uh, we were we went from the campsite, drove to the other side of the island to to uh, for, to the bay to to swim. And, and one of the boys lost his glasses in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the sea. And we looked and couldn't find, so we went home. And then we told the lady at the campsite, so this is 30 miles away on the other side of the island, um, that Gerard lost his glasses. And, and she reached behind the counter and said, are these his glasses? It turned out that she works at the, um, she worked at the, uh, at the shop there. On, on the beach. And when the tide had gone out after we'd left, she saw something glinting in the sun, <laughs> which his glasses and brought them. Um, so I, for a while I thought, well, these are, you know, that, that this is something I can hang on to is that experiences like this. But then it doesn't follow, as I was saying, from the fact that we have coincidences in our life and indeed answers to prayer. You know, I can say that God's been looking after me and many times I've been driving and I felt delivered that, you know, if, if something had happened an instant before I would be dead or seriously injured. And I, I'm just, I think maybe you two have had such experiences too in your life when you felt that there was someone watching over you and, um, and has saved you or delivered you. And, and I have that feeling with myself as well. I think um, sometimes that, that indeed there is a God who is watching over me. But when the point comes when you think, well, all right, this may be true, but it does not follow that this scaffolding, this structure, um, Christian story, full redemption, eschatology, heaven and hell, the Bible, Jesus' resurrection, sin and salvation, you know, division of humankind into two, uh, two, two, two groups, 
the saved and the damned, all of that follows from the fact I've had these experiences. And indeed, people in other religions have also experiences where prayer is answered, um, they feel um, presence of something beyond themselves, um, but they don't conclude from that that the Christianity must be true. Um, maybe they conclude from that that uh, Islam is true, if they're, you know, uh, is, uh, Muslim mystics or Buddhism is true. So, uh, so do, do take my point there, that the, if we have these, these positive things in our life, it doesn't follow from that, that we have to then see that as proof of the Christian doctrine is true. I do, I do. So, so yeah, so that illuminates. So with your experiences, um, they were kind of non-factive. They didn't carry with them propositional content or that sort of thing. Yeah, that's right, yes. Whereas yes. I, I think like with my experience, it actually come, there's a company uh, properly basic beliefs that Christianity is true or that Jesus rose from the dead or something like that. And again, I've only had a handful of such experiences that give rise to these beliefs. Um, so I, you know, I think that the inner witness of the Holy Spirit is, it's a testifying model of how that works. It, the Holy Spirit testifies propositional content to us and our faculties respond by producing that experience as well as an accompanying properly basic belief. But yeah, in your case, you didn't have that. So in that case, I would agree fully with, with what you're saying. Like, you know, lots of people have a sense of presence or something. And what can you infer from that? Well, you can't say, was well, that Allah? Is that the Christian God and that sort of thing? So yeah, I, I take your point. So Dale, you say that you've had this propositional content then. Yeah. Um, is that getting towards what it is to be a Christian? I mean, are we able to, um, are you able to define what it is for you to be a Christian? How much do you have to take on board to believe? Um, I, I am, and I, I was planning to get to that. I, I just first- Okay, we can get to it later if you like. There's three, yeah, three issues that I want to get to. So the first one is the goodness of God and the problem of evil. Second is your take on the evidence for the resurrection. Um, and then defining what is a Christian. And if, if we have more time, I'll leave it to you as the guest, any, any issue that you want us to do. But okay. the, the first thing I really want to get to, because I think that this is important. So you, one of your issues is the goodness of God. And I, I was listening very, very carefully to your case. It was mostly kind of like the Old Testament biblical God he did genocide, he did all these bad things, so he's bad. But you're still a general theist. You still believe in a God. Um, so I just kind of wanted you to kind of clarify that. And how obviously there's the problem of evil against general theism, and that's not an issue for you. There's still enough planks for you to believe that there is some kind of God generally out there, despite yeah. acts of rape, acts of genocide that this God is allowing in the world. So, like, what's the yeah, difference? That's right. Yeah, indeed. And, and for a while, you know, being a thinking kind of person, I was able to um, hold it together um, by, you know, we, we, we um, in the, for the Christian idea of God, according to the fathers, uh, the traditional attributes of God, you know, omnipotent, omniscient, creator of all, uh, omnibenevolent, did I say it right? Yeah, benevolence, benevolence. I, I get it wrong all the time. So. Yeah, yes, <laughs> and only present, and, and so on. all seeing, all knowing, um, creator God, and God who knows the future. So um, the consequence of that picture of God is that when God created, He knew exactly what would happen at every instant in the future, and there being an, only one future ahead, which is the future. So this is God's perfect foreknowledge. So that gives God responsibility for everything that happens. So if we believe that um, there were really an Adam and an Eve in the Garden of Eden, and that Adam and Eve's decision to eat the fruit uh, was the result of evil, then when God put Adam and Eve in that garden, he knew exactly what was going to happen. So God is responsible for the evil in the world. Um, now, of course, if we start, if we relax any of those assumptions, um, and bear in mind that the Bible is, is, you know, like many topics, as I said before, is it will say one thing about God or anything, and then contradict itself somewhere else. Um, 
so we get that you know we may have a picture that 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 god sees everything um in advance certainly from parts of the bible um but you know we we could still kind of hold on to maybe he doesn't and so uh a doctrine has in the last i suppose 30 years the doctrine of open theism has been put forward by christian philosophers and to which God does not actually know the future. The future is open to God as it is to us. Um, so there's no the future for God to know. Uh. Um, so it's a way of relaxing the omniscience of God while allowing God to remain the creator and omnipotent if we, if he, he may be, but, uh, but unknowing about the future because there is no single future to know which would be consistent with the parts of the Bible where God does appear to act as an agent in time, um, not knowing what is going to be the result. So, you know, some parts of the Bible speak of God as knowing the future, you know, as the beginning from the end, etc. Other parts of the Bible um, speak about God acting unaware of what's going to happen. And, you know, so... For a while then, I, I went along with that, and, and I mentioned Dale Tuggy to you as well, uh -huh. um, Dr. Dale Tuggy, who's Unitarian, and he's a, a, a Christian philosopher, and he's put forward um, open theism, along with others, William Haskell as well, uh, another famous philosopher. And so that kind of doctrine has, has attracted me for a long time, and, and I still think there's something in it. Um, so that's a way of kind of reconciling yourself and, and saying, well, okay, then... Uh, we let God off the hook then for uh, letting evil into the world. Um, he didn't know it was going to happen like that. You know, he put Adam and Eve in the garden, not knowing how it was going to turn out. Um, but, uh, you know, that, so that's a kind of, if you like, it's a workaround that, 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 that's, that's possible for a while for me. Um, oh, sorry. So yeah, we could I... kind of hang on to open theism and believing that resurrection of Jesus was more probable than not and that we can make some sense of salvation and that God does answer prayer and the Bible is inspired in some way, if not inerrant. So, you know, I could hand off. That was a holding position for me for a long time. Gotcha. OK, so that so that makes sense then to me, because what I was trying to get at with this question is obviously you still maintain your belief in a God, despite the problem of evil in general. You know, there's yes. genocides and this God would be allowing that kind of thing. But if you take the open theism route, uh, that might not necessarily be available to a biblical God, or if it, if it is, it's contradictory as you're saying. So that's why there's a difference in your yes, mind. That's right. Okay. Yes. All right, cool. Well, that's David exactly. Russell. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, carry on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to turn it to David Russell. Like what, what's your take in terms of the, the problem of evil and like solutions to, handle that and is there a difference in solutions available to handle it for general theism versus defending a biblical the christian god well i think that there's you know i like most philosophers i divided up the logical and the emotional and stuff like that so i, I pretty much take the that that traditional route and from what i've learned is that you know the obviously the logical problem of evil isn't really on the forefront anymore uh they use the emotional problem of evil and i for some reason i just don't think they carry weight because i i think it i think we have to uh cross over into uh theology when we talk about evil and you know if we're going to use definitions such as evil we have to admit first there is an evil that we can we can uh uh you know base that on so yes I, I and i am a molinist uh slash arminian if you want to say so i do yeah. think that the free will defense is very strong when it comes to uh you know what god does and and that middle knowledge plays a huge role you know but you know god doesn't want a group of automatons you know even though that he may know there may be that greater good that or I wouldn't even say that there's a purpose, you know, that that is there that we may not. I mean, we see finite, you know, I mean, we're like 
you know, we don't have we have a bird's eye view or, or we see through a glass darkly. We don't see the entirety of the plan that co- that's going to come to fruition here. But I think freedom is essential for things like love. Uh, freedom is essential for for uh, free choices. I mean, if 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 God's going to give us free choices, there has to be a choice to actually choose between. So, uh, yeah. And I think that if he based it off that, I, I do believe highly in potential. Uh, versus actuality so i think that we were created with the potential to sin and i think god knew the best representative of us and that's why he put adam in in the garden and you know as far as it comes to the christian faith i think that you know that's i think it, it holds uh when it comes to you know justly thinking about these things so i i is that does that make sense dale yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, as you know, I'm I'm on your side personally. I take sort of the similar approach. To yeah, both, it's kind of hard to like put it all. Uh, you know, I didn't write it out. I don't have my 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 stuff for uh, oh, yeah, great. <laughs> in, in front of me. But yeah, but um, I, I really do think it holds in the fact that you know if if I don't think the problem of evil can exist without some sort of free will theodicy. You know, otherwise, I think that. Uh, there is a definite problem for Christians if they believe that God did create evil. Okay. But I don't think that that's, that's the case. I think that we're the, the actualizers of evil, you know, and it's because God loved us enough to show us and teach us what love is by giving us freedom, you know, and that freedom can exist that our love cannot exist without that freedom. I don't think it can. I've never heard an argument that makes sense where love can exist without freedom. Gotcha. All right, cool. Um, awesome. All right. Well, uh, one, this will be my, my last topic and then I'm going to open it up to David Campbell to lead the discussion because this is about him and his reasons. But I, I did really want to ask you, David K, um, uh, about the minimal facts approach to the resurrection and or any approach, like trying apologetics, trying to prove the resurrection. This is one of your your issues here in, in your list is the resurrection of Jesus. So yeah. what did you, what did you make of that as a Christian? Um, and, and what happened? Like, why is that an issue? Do you, do you just think the evidence isn't good enough to prove it? Do you think that there's evidence proving it didn't happen? Like what, what's the issue with the resurrection? Yes. Well, you, you, when you're, when you're a Christian, when you call yourself a Christian, you just believe it, don't you? I mean, you just believe that, that, that Christ rise, rose from the dead. Um, it's one of those things that you accept. Uh, and so for a long time, I just accepted that along with the whole Bible being true. Um, so I, I've, then we, once you let go of the fact that we'll let go of the belief that the Bible is without error. And then I think what happened to me was just studying um, uh, putting aside the Old Testament and so kind of relying upon the New Testament as my basis for faith, which is the kind of position I was in, you know, say five years ago, three years ago, four years ago. Um, then looking at the problems in the New Testament, uh, things like, you know, just errors there in the New Testament or things that um, I don't think happen. For instance, Matthew's story of the flight to Egypt or the mass resurrection of the saints. The fact that Judas dies in seemingly two different ways, um, Matthew and Luke uh, in Acts, um, things like that. And the, the name of the high priest in, in Mark 2, you know, that's the familiar one uh, where um, the, the, the verse says, Abiathar, when in fact it was Ahimelech, um, a flight to Egypt. I, don't, I think Matthew just inserted that. I don't think it was meant to be a true story. Um, that... And so once you, once you, once I, I realized that just because it's there in the New Testament doesn't mean it's true, then you can have doubts about all kinds of things because you're seeing these as historical documents written by human beings, uh, doing their best often to, to present a truth, but by no means always trying to present historical truth. And so I think, I think my, my strongest, um, reason for holding on to the resurrection is actually the story in Acts, uh, the book of Acts, 
because um, I, I think that the, the writer of Luke and Acts was trying his best to set out a historical record uh, using the evidence and the people he talked to. Um, and if we can sort of go back and think of that as those as historical documents, the book, um, certainly the Book of Acts as a record of the growth of the church, then we can, based on reliance upon, we got something solid to stand upon, if you see what I mean. But we're still looking at these as historical documents. So at the beginning of 2020, I was thinking to myself, I, I studied, um, you know, Tim McGrew. Yeah. Yeah, so I studied his, his chapter in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology on the Resurrection, uh, which I don't know if you've read it, but he goes into Bayesian probability. Yeah. And for a while, I was really convinced by his arguments. You know, you've got these witnesses, you've got the women, you've got the disciples, and you've got Paul. And if we treat those as independent, we multiply probabilities when you've got, when you assume independence. Yeah. And so you get the probability that um, the ratio, if you like, or the base factor of the resurrection to the not resurrection, um, given the, ev the evidence, given the resurrection is so much more probable than the evidence given the non-resurrection. So those kinds of theories for a while convinced me, but then I, I started to read skeptics on that as well. And the assumption of independence is really shaky, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's these kind of considerations now. You, we, we're talking about reasoning, aren't we? And reasoning, historical reasoning, um, treating these as historical documents. And, and we're aware that, that we're not sure when they were written. We don't even know who, who wrote them, um, how the distance from the events that they describe all of these things um, at a distance of 2000 years and written by people who had a real vested interest in um, propagating the truth of what they were writing about. So you wouldn't look at say the gospel of Matthew and say that the author of that gospel is disinterested um, uh, seeker after historical truth. Uh, he's, he's, he's writing things that you may know. And indeed um, the gospel of John uh, end of chapter 20 says exactly that. These things are written so that you might know and believe that Jesus is the Christ. So, you know, we, we're talking about documents written a long time ago, not always written um, with, a, with a kind of how we would call them um, written by historians or biographers. So it's a matter of weighing up things. And I, I would still say at the end of last, beginning of last year, I would put my, my subjective probability of a resurrection at about 0.7. But as I read um, and studied more, I, I thought, well, yeah, the skeptics view makes as much sense, a naturalistic explanation for these, um, for the, how some people believe they saw the risen Jesus, makes as much sense as possible that that could have happened. We, we you know, we, we've got instances in history where we, we have people who believe that something happened and founded movements, but we don't actually believe those things happened. And we have the story, you know, there's the Mormons, you know, which are much recent uh, in, in our own history. And a, a lot of people believe and still believe that those things recorded in the Book of Mormon really, really occurred. But we, you know, the non-Mormons don't believe it really happened. <laughs> and that was more recent. Um, but they all believed it and they wrote it down as if it was true, you know, so, so we can, just because it's written down, it doesn't make it true. Yeah. All right. um, just because somebody said they saw something doesn't mean they actually did see it or they, they saw, they thought they saw something, but maybe they didn't. Um, and, and yeah, and so, so the, the McGrew article is, is a very good one, um, but it, it, it's built on these assumptions. Uh, which, which, if you start to sort of question some of them, then, then it doesn't give you such conclusive um, evidence, really, that, that the resurrection really must have happened. Another point I should mention is the appearance to Paul, because according to the Bible, um, this happened after the ascension. So any vision that Paul had would not have been of bodily resurrection, but was a vision. And people may have visions, um, but it doesn't count for proof of the resurrection. It may be some proof that Jesus is alive in some sense, you know, 
uh, spiritually, that that's, that the, the appearance to Paul has nothing to do with the actual resurrection issue. If you see um, what I mean, Jesus may not have been resurrected bodily, but still uh, have appeared to Paul. And okay. so that's one that's one third of the evidence that McGrew cites, um, which yeah. is, you know I consider doesn't count for yeah. the resurrection. It may it may count. Jesus is alive today. Yes, okay, but but not that he was resurrected bodily. Um, okay. This is what we're talking about. Okay, um, I have one last quick question, then I'm going to turn it to David R to, to kind of ask you about what you said about the resurrection case there. But what what do you make of uh, people like Gary Habermas or, or Mike Lacona and that and they, they've kind of done research into psychological studies to probe about the nature of some of the appearances. So for, for in my books, really the appearance to the 12 is the only thing that I find in isolation is convincing that the resurrection probably happened. And one of the arguments there that I find persuasive is they'll say, well, look at the nature of the resurrection appearances. They saw multiple people, saw Jesus uh, in a normal guise. He wasn't glorified, which was the expectation. And they'll cite psychological literature whereby our expectations determine what we see, if it was a hallucination or, or illusion or something like that. But yet they're going contra to the expectations of that time. And that makes it improbable that a cycle, it was just a vision or a hallucination or something. Have you encountered that kind of reasoning? What do you make of that? Well, yes, I have. Um, and I haven't, I'm not a psychologist. So, you know, all I can do is quote studies <laughs> or read, read people who quote studies. Um, we don't, the, the appearances to the 12. Now, those, um, I, Mark does not record um, appearances to the 12. Um, Matthew, I, uh, um, in my own mind, I discount everything that Matthew says because I know that he invents stuff. Uh, that is my belief. I, I believe that in chapter 27, the story of the saints being resurrected, um, I don't believe that happens and uh, it's not in any of the other gospels and would be truly you know, remarkable if it had, um, you know, and it would have been reported in the others. So what we've got are Luke and John, which are two separate, um, you know, as we know, Luke, well, as we think, um, Luke used Matthew, but his own resurrection appearances, he's got his own source for that, hasn't he? So, uh, and I, uh, you know, so I, I would say, you know, I'd be holding on to that, as, as my best, best evidence for the appearances to the disciples is what's recorded in Luke. Gotcha. We've got separate with story, stories there that are not in any of the other gospels. We've got the, the appearances of the, uh, the, the two, to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, which is not in any other gospel. Um, with, with John, we have a different problem because again, the dating of this gospel is, is, is much more, um, uncertain isn't it now i, I still i i believe that um an early dating of the three synoptic gospels and, and, and i take um that as face value that that acts finished around about at the time when the story finishes so around about 62 so i'd say mark is in the 50s and and luke is in the late 50s uh, but john we don't we don't really know um and who um, where it, you know, when it was finally put together, but it's certainly based on eyewitnesses sources to some extent, but such a long remove, how can we, um, we, we, we know that, you know, did Jesus actually say the things that recorded of him in, in John? So different from what the synoptics, how the synoptics describe him. Um, did he speak in that kind of Greek? Um, it's, it's obviously somebody put that together who belong to some Johannine school, but there's some, obviously some eyewitness elements in there, but can we really trust it? I don't know. I mean, I think we have to come down to, do we trust what Luke records there, um, both in his gospel and in Acts, which records the ascension uh, there. So, you know, I'd be saying, I, I, I'm still equivocal. You know, my, my probability, you know, if we're talking about subjective prior probabilities of these things, or sorry, posterior probabilities. 
of around about 0.5 uh, a resurrection. I don't believe these things are impossible. Um, you know, I do believe miracles could happen. Um, things, uh, strange things do happen. I don't disbelieve. I don't believe that um, all phenomena can be accounted for by science. So I, I'm my 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 pointer on the dial is hovering around 0.5. Gotcha. All right. Cool. Even. Yeah. So, you know, if, if uh -huh. you or anyone can, you know, or, or like Nakona could tip me just a little way, uh, then I'd go back <laughs> and say, I think the, the resurrection is more probable than not. Yeah, I'm, I might send you. So, so that's good. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, I yeah, might... so I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a total skeptic now, you know, I'm um, and I'm really impressed by um, uh, the Bible scholar called Dale, Dale Allison. Yeah. So I don't know if you've heard of him, um, but yeah. I've read a, a couple of his books recently, and he's got a new book on the resurrection, hasn't he? Which has just come out. Yeah, I haven't read that one, but yeah, and, and he said, well, he says so many things. I haven't read that book, but I've I've seen him in his interviews. He has a show with um, Mike Lacona, doesn't he? And um, which, and he says, well, there's so much we don't know. We just that really don't know what actually happened. We don't have enough evidence to be sure. Um, who are these 500 in 1 Corinthians 15? We don't know. Uh, were they one at a time or all at one go? We don't know. Um, that mass hallucinations are, are, uh, are possible. And he cites this, this um, event, you know, in, in Cairo in the 1950s, where this great light show happened over a Coptic church. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of that. Oh, yeah. And yeah, it went on for I was just yeah. going to say, one of uh, a mutual friend, Caleb Jackson, he, he is doing a whole book on miracles and he, he goes into a lot on that specific. All right. That you're talking about, OK. But, yeah. So, cool. yeah. So there's a lot we don't we we, we 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 don't know about things. Things are happening. We can't boil it down to science. All right. Um, but but, you know, Dale Allison is, confesses to be a, a rather schizophrenic because he's a church goer. He <laughs> prays <laughs> and all that. But when it gets down to his scholarship, he's saying, looking at these documents is historical. We just don't know. We haven't got conclusive proof from these that the resurrection happened. That's the way I read it. But I haven't read the read the book. Um, I just read a couple of his earlier ones. Yeah, say, same here. All right, awesome. So yeah, I, I think that that's definitely a potential, if you're agnostic on that, there's potential for progress. I, I might send you a couple of Things, in particular, a book by Andrew Loke, which I think is very thorough on some of the appearances. Oh yes, oh yeah. I've just been listening to um, a Paul Ogier video with him. <laughs> oh, oh goodness, yeah. They had a, a bit. Of, yeah. Or no, that was, who did he have a fight? Yeah, it was Paul Ogier or something. But uh... Paul Ogier, yeah, yeah. It's I've got it. I've got it just here. Um, who saw risen Jesus? Twenty second of January, twenty one. Yeah, it so was about, about a year ago. All right, cool. So David Russell, I don't, I know you're getting antsy. I can see it in the thing. I, I want to give you a chance to to speak about what we've been saying on the case of the resurrection. Uh, what do you make of what David say, David Campbell is saying, David Kay is saying about his issues with the resurrection, why he's kind of iffy about it? Yeah, man, there's a lot to cover. I mean, you guys went, uh, I mean, David, you went over so much. I mean, it's it's hard to break down each and every aspect. But for me, like, I can't, I wouldn't, okay, personally, I wouldn't be able to ascribe a number until I've looked at all the evidence, right? And I understand it's a journey for you, so I'm not, like, saying, you know, you're not doing that or anything. Mm -hmm. But, like, what I, what I am saying is, it, as a Christian, and you yourself as a former Christian, you know, before I gave up what I held to, and what I committed my life to, it seems that like before I could say I just can't buy it, I would have to like come to the point where you're saying, you know, yeah, some of these things I'm iffy about, but I'm open to them. And that's fine. I just don't think that I could go the route and say, um, you know, I'm skeptical about it I, 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 or, or, or I'm giving it up. I can't call myself a Christian. I, I don't think that I could get to that point. But as far as the evidences go, I think that we have to take into consideration how history's done. You know, um, I do think that 
the gospels are greco-roman biographies they they meet all that criteria so i don't know what what other historians that that you've been listening to on that end have said but i every every i mean even skeptical ones are like yeah and the fact that 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 we don't know who wrote what is a, a a normal staple to those type of biographies matter of fact uh ep sanders he actually tells us uh, that it's more prestigious to have a, a biography be anonymous. Uh, but we do have excellent early church traditions that have always held. I, I mean, we have a canon that has always been. I mean, you can see it it coming from a mile away. It's the the the, the four gospels were always part of the early church. You know, they were always a part of it. That we do know. Um, there's several things we do. And, and like when I look at first Corinthians, I'm not going to look at like, well, who are those 500 witnesses? What I'm saying is, wow, they believe that there was a risen Jesus within two to three years. They were preaching this. They've already developed a creed. And then I then I start looking at the other creeds. Right. And these early creeds that are attesting to some sort of divinity. And then I'm seeing other historical sources on the outside saying, yeah, these Christians believe he was God. So at that point, I am at the, the very starting point of saying, OK, so what's the best explanation for why they believe that? And I think that uh, people like Lacona and Habermas have really dispelled the fact that, uh, it, you know, the psychology aspect of it. So I, I, I for me, the best explanation is these things did occur historically. And, you know, like uh, another thing is, how did they write history? If we're unsure of how they wrote certain things in history, like phrases or, or the use of hyperbole, then it's it, it's it's incumbent upon us to actually research those out. Like you're saying in Matthew 27, for example, uh, I don't think Matthew's making stuff up. I'm not ready to make that uh, uh accusation because i understand that matthew was a jew and they are given to uh hyperbole and certain apocalyptic type of literature so i mean i take all that into consideration when i when i read that and i have to be able to say okay it makes more sense that maybe this was that type of literature why because the history shows in several other places that Jews commonly did this type of stuff, you know, like Jesus saying, uh, I don't think Jesus was making up the idea that a star is going to fall to earth because, I mean, a star literally would war dissolve this planet before it got to a certain uh, part of us. Right. So, like, I, I do understand that there is hyperbole and I use it today. And I kind of think about that today. Like, I, I, I was just telling uh, uh, a friend of mine that it was it, it was like raining cats and dogs. Right. You know, um, and, and, you know, I'm not going to literally read that, read that or, or uh, you know, think he's actually believing that there's cats and dogs coming down out of the sky. But I'm going to, like, look into it and say, OK, he's saying it's raining pretty bad, you know, and so that's kind of like how I look at it. And, and I want to be fair with the history. I want to look at the avenue. I want to learn history before I make a judgment on history. I want to learn about certain uh, uh, styles of writing. That that his that that the ancients used and make a judgment on that before I, you know, say, well, he's he's maybe making things up, you know, um, but uh, and not only that, but like when it comes to like bias and stuff, uh, I think everybody writes with a bias. And yeah, like you said, John says that these guys wrote to the fact that that that, you know, they want him to believe. Well, obviously, they're trying to evangelize. They're trying to save the lost. They're trying to push people out of front of a moving train per, per se you know um so yeah I, but but it doesn't it, to me that doesn't necessitate that they were uh giving us false any type of false information or they weren't writing historically because i think they were writing arco roman biography the way it was written back in their times and that's why i think we see uh, a mass a mass amount of historians say that uh uh they categorize the gospels in uh um greco-roman biography and another thing is is that um uh i've seen unitarians and i'm not like trying to accuse you of this uh david because i know you, that that's the oneness type of uh environment 
you've uh, come from. And also, uh, I, I haven't I, I've observed this also with the Torah keepers is that there is a very large push to push out the gospel of John. And ever since the discovery of the John Rylands papyrus, I think John is well within uh, believing that an early date is possible. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's a lot of historians that 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 hold to the later date, but I I think there's just as much evidence to hold to an early date as an early date to the to the Gospel of uh, uh, or the Synoptics and Acts. So I, I really think that we can put that into that realm, you know. So I, I'm really not. I, I just by the way we do history, I'm not I, I don't think I would ever be able to just say, well, you know, I, I can't I, I've got to go this route. I, I think that like you jumped with the skeptics. Uh, and I want to say this, but and, and it may not be true because I'm not you, obviously, but it sounds like from what you've said that you did a little bit of research here, but then you listen to a lot of the skeptics. But then you listen to Dale Allison, and you know, so it just sounds like you're on a journey aspect, you know. And my encouragement would be never stop that journey, and and make sure you cover all your bases before you make a hard stance. All right, awesome. Thank you. So, yeah, Bye. thank you for, for your take there. That, that was, was long that was as well. Yeah, uh, awesome. <laughs> um, cool. So I think that that covers the resurrection thing. I want to make sure we have time to fit in uh, some of. David Kay's other reasons and address those. So, um, can, can I ask him a few questions before we get started on that? Because I know you've kind of like held the questions out, and I'll let him do it. He can answer as quick as he wants. Uh, I only have really one that that really that really is kind of getting to me that I want to yeah. see what, what what David's take is. David, so, let, so let, I hate talking ask. about you in a in a third person. <laughs> no, no worries. Yeah, yeah, Russell. Uh, that's fine, of course, because David. Yeah. Yeah. So, but let's let's wrap it up in five minutes unless unless it's going to be less willing, than that it's going to be less than that cool are, are you willing yeah. to go slightly longer or is that like a hard hard limit no there? that's fine no 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 we, 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 that was just a suggestion but we, we've uh, we've un uncovered a few um few things here so i'm happy to go on a bit longer awesome thank you yeah go, right. go for it david Art. yeah so um what do you think now this is just a question what do you think about the transmission and the preservation of the new testament because i find that almost miraculous that you have five different locations that are coming together and we pretty much get the same thing i mean textual critics say there's only like 40 lines of the entire new testament that are unresolved i think that's that's pretty miraculous and and i think that lends to the cre credit of christianity uh being true um and that's just me but anyways that was it <laughs> so well um you got to address that well yeah, that, 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 that may be true. Certainly by the end of the second century, um, the church had very much fixed upon the books it was going to regard as, as the Bible, as the New Testament. Um, but um, we, we can look at the other ones that they kind of discarded and say, yeah, there were good reasons for thinking that those, those four, for instance, those purported gospels were the ones that we choose to treat as authentic. But of course, we, we, we don't, we don't have the autographs, do we? Oh, no, no. And I don't think we necessarily need the autographs if, if we have textual criticism. And I think that's the, 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 the wonder of textual criticism when it comes to historical documents is mm. that whole science and art behind that. And to me, diving into that and like learning about that, like I have a good friend uh, that I talk to quite often is Dr. Stephen Boyce about text. And we'll, we'll like just like. I'll, I'll ask him a few things here and there as as things come up when it when it when I get into the study. But to me, it's just it's super amazing. It's a super amazing science and art. Yeah, well, I I, I would um, I I won't contest that. I mean, I I would say that it's logically possible that these books could have been written in the early part of the second century and and from then on treated as the Gospels. I don't believe that. Um, I, I believe that they are historical documents, and that they that they were written. Uh, as I was saying, I mean, I, I believe that you know the undisputed letters of Paul were by a guy called Paul, and and Acts was written by a guy who was a companion of Paul. So I, I believe that that would be the best explanation for these documents. 
uh, as I said, I do believe in early dating of the synoptics. As to John, yeah, I, I also, I, I read uh, John Robinson, who you've, um, uh, you've heard of him. Not the, not the scholar, not the biblical scholar, John A.T. Robinson, who wrote a book called Redating the New Testament. And then another book called Redating John, I think Redating John or An Early Date for John. And, and I go with some of his arguments. So I'm, I'm not at all, you know, believing that John has to be written in the 90s. Um, it could, or at least it could go back to um, eyewitness testimony from the early days, from, from the source. Um, you know, we've got a strand of eyewitness testimony there. So it could well have been written quite early. Um, but as to, you made the point about biographies. As I said, I don't believe there was a flight to Egypt. And I don't believe Matthew was trying to write the Greco-Roman biography. He was a Jew and Jews didn't treat, didn't, he, he was, um, they treated scripture as, as something to quarry meaning out of, you know. Um, it, 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 I mean, if you look at Matthew 2, um, the reference to flight to Egypt is um, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Um, there's no, if you read Matthew 2 alongside Luke 2, um, and just try to see them both as telling the same story at the same time, there's no way that there could have been a flight to Egypt in between um, the going to Bethlehem, from going from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, because that's the days of Mary's purification, according to Luke, which is 30 days maximum. So I know there are various get arounds from that. Some say that Matthew 2 is a kind of toddler's gospel, a toddler narrative, not a birth narrative. And it was written, described two, two or so years later. Um, other people say that you've got kind of Luke knows about the, um, knew I, about the flight to Egypt, but doesn't record it. But anyway. Um, yeah, can if, I, can if I you interject see, one? If you read Matthew, he's not writing, he's not writing history. Now you've got the case for Luke writing history. I would agree with you, but not Matthew. Yeah, and that's and that's the only thing I, I think I would give you pushback on, and, and maybe you can answer this as well. Matthew's written in five discourses, and that is right par part and parcel into uh, the way they wrote biographies back then um, as well. I mean, yeah, different schools of thought, but still Re Greco-Roman biography. So, uh, and, and just because he's a Jew, I think that Matthew, as being a tax collector and, and being probably influenced by uh, the Roman system and the Greek system would have easily given them the idea saying, hey, I need to write this to as so not only Jews understand it and have the elements of, of Jewishness mm -hmm. in it, but also for a Gentile audience, because Gentile inclusion was a real thing and it was a real historical yeah. issue. And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, if if what we believe about uh, the traditions about Matthew and where he went and where he was, uh, you know, uh, killed. He went to the he went ended up going out to the Gentiles, you know. So yeah. uh, it was not like Paul. I'm not saying he was went to the Western Gentiles. I think he may have went to the African, what they would have considered Gentiles there. But uh, you know, so if we're going to believe that any of the church tradition, I kind of like want to look at it as a whole and say, okay, what makes the most sense? So, but the discourses, I, I, I think that's, uh, anyways, I think that's a good argument. Hmm. Yes, well, um, we don't know that the, the disciple Matthew wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Um, there's certainly nothing in the text that says so. And indeed, there's, you know, very little eyewitness testimony there, which tells us that, you know, that the author of this book was actually there and was, was that disciple. But as I say, you know, just with, with this incident here, the flight to Egypt, you can't just fit that into Luke's narrative. Um, it, it, it doesn't fit. You can't, a, a journey to Egypt would be, you know, at least a year, I mean, to, at least a year to go there, wait for Herod to die and come back. Uh, so it, you know, it's, it, 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 it does start you to question what is actually true. Um, and as I said, I, I don't believe that the person who wrote Matthew was trying necessarily to put in historical truth everywhere. I think the, the resurrection of the saints, the fact that we've got inconsistent accounts of Judas's death in Matthew and in Acts, um, so it speaks that, that he's using um, the Old Testament to, to, to um, 
to prove that Jesus is the Messiah and bringing in incidents as, as like a flight to Egypt to prove that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you take on board the, t the traditions, but then I don't see any reason to believe the traditions. Um, and you know, I, I'm thinking of what's here and what's here in the Bible. We've got some documents here, um, but we can say, you know, of the Mormon church, they have their documents, they have their traditions. Why should we believe them? They believe them, but that doesn't mean that we should believe them. Uh, obviously, you believe yeah, them. Yeah, but, but, yeah absolutely. You know, I mean, the Mormons yeah. will say to, 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 to me, to us, exactly what you're saying to me is we have to look at all the evidence. And uh, there's the evidence, there, and it's real, all, all there in the Book of Mormon and in the traditions around the, the you know, the, 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 the origins of the Book of Mormon. And, and um, but, so, so you, you, you that, don't say we got David, to be Mormons. David, just one thing though is like when I, I have debated Mormons and when they they don't they can't provide the evidences that uh justify their book and when 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 they try and i know there's there's new mormon apologists popping up all the time now but they rely on a subjective experience only okay. they don't i, I but but anyways yeah and, and i'm not you know of course i'd have a, a disagreement on on the traditions and stuff Stuff like that. I mean, it's not just traditions. I mean, we have second century writers that are defending the Gospels and they use all the synoptics. And there's a reason they're synoptic is because they do parallel each other quite well. So I yeah, I, it, it, that's probably where I, I would probably say I think it's more uh, uh, probable that they are. But anyways, Dale, I know you want to you, you want to move on. So and I promised you just uh, that that would just be a second. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's there's so much it just it will never end whenever you whenever you so, so much. Well, maybe maybe we could have another go um sometime if if you let me there's there's i really wanted to come back on the problem of evil um and and okay. and, 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 and modernism but you know we don't have time to do that justice uh, that that's a really good and in fact the um you know the recent unbelievable show uh, with uh, william lane craig and uh, james white James White. Yeah. Um, of course, you you uh, you that you picked up my comments on that show. Yeah. So that was exactly on supposed to be at least on the problem of evil, although it didn't actually get there very much, did it? But but there's a lot we could say there. And also, what is a Christian? You know, you well, two guys, yeah. Dale, you're saying you're a Christian, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. And 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 David, you are. You know. And I'm saying, well, I I'm not now. Um, but. What you know? At what point do you do you say I am a Christian? What do I have to hold on to to be a Christian? And maybe you and you know you two don't actually agree on everything, and and you can find a Calvinist and Arminian would disagree. So you know Craig and 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 White on that show. You know um, what White is a Calvinist, Reformed, and Craig is a Molinist. So they they really differ on salvation, don't they? Um, and they differ on how we are saved. They differ on their doctrine of God, yet they call each other, at least one of them called the other brother. So, yeah. so they think that they, they're prepared to call each other Christians. Uh, so how far can we, can we stretch this label? Yeah, I think that, yeah, and that's exactly, so you picked out exactly the, the next topic that I wanted to fit in, because I know that this is really important to you, is this question of what is, what I call Christianity proper. What are the, what is it that's essential and what's secondary and how do we determine that sort of thing? Um, so just to give my, my thought process and I'll, I'll turn it to David Russell as well, but the way I do that, so in terms of methodology, I allow, so in the first place we have the Bible that claims to be divine inspiration. The Protestant Bible minimally is something that everyone who claims to be a Christian agrees is from God. So we start there. And I allow it as God's word to define what is essential versus not. So either whatever the Bible says explicitly, this, you know, for example, belief in Jesus' resurrection. This, there are verses that explicitly say, if you believe this, you're saved. If you don't, you go to hell. Or there's verses that talk about you need to repent. If, if you don't repent of your sins, you're going to hell. If you do repent or whatever. So these are things that the Bible explicitly says are conditions to be a Christian and a saved Christian at that. Um, 
And then there are also additionally things that are implied. So for example, there's verses, I think somewhere in first John, I, I don't have the Bible verses memorized, uh, maybe David Russell or, or you can help me, but in first John, it talks about verses that says in order to be saved, the difference between being saved and, and damned, you have to keep Jesus commandments um, and be willing, trying your best to keep Jesus commandments in accordance with true repentance. So through that, well, what are Jesus' commands? So that could be implied that being a homosexual, not uh, engaging in homosexual behavior is a sin. And if you're willingly doing it, or if you're engaging in hetero, premarital heterosexual union, or if you're a, a thief, you're constantly stealing stuff and, you know, you're not repentant of that. Okay, well, that implies you're, you're going to hell um, because you're not... In your heart of hearts, you're not keeping Jesus' commandments. You're not doing your best to repent of your sin. So those are a couple of examples. That's how I determine that and that alone represents the core, nothing else. So secondary details, there's nothing in the Bible that explicitly says you have to be a Calvinist or a Molinist to go to heaven, nor implies that your understanding of how the atonement works, for example, determines whether you go to heaven or hell so there could be latitude there so that that's my method um yeah i guess i'll let you respond to me and then i'll go to david russell to give his take what's his answer to what is a christian but yeah what do you okay. think of that yes indeed well uh, yeah first john two four maybe okay um is 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 one possible verse there um yes indeed romans 10 9 now my um my number my my two top salvation salvation verses if you like are john 3 16 and romans 10 9 so i would hold on to those really and and that's what i you know I, as a christian that's what i would have stood by romans the romans verse says if thou shalt confess confess with thy mouth the lord jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that god hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved Sure. You know, he's talking about the Jews, but I think that, that Paul's message there is, 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 is for all time there. We could treat that as, 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 as near as possible a New Testament definition of salvation. Yeah, I would agree as well. Yeah, indeed. And, um, and indeed. And of course, belief, we can say, um, you know, it, it's, it's really hard to command yourself to, to believe. If you doubt this is the point you know when someone asks you do i believe and i say yes i believe but you secretly doubt actually you're not believing with your heart are you so mm -hmm. if someone doesn't believe if someone has said I'm, I'm skeptical enough not to believe that it happened then um then according to that you're not saved you're damned but it's not something that you could command yourself to do if you see what i mean it's just, I, I, I just look at the evidence now, and I know that, that um, David, you said that I haven't gone into everything thoroughly, but I have done a fair bit of research, <laughs> and I, I don't believe now that the evidence is there for me to say it's more probable than not that Jesus was raised from the dead. So does that mean I'm damned? Well, I'm not sure. But anyway, Dale, you have, that's a very minimal definition, isn't yes. it, of, yeah. of being a Christian? However, you also you excluded all the homosexual Christians from being Christians, haven't you? The ones that are uh, willingly practicing practicing yes, the practicing homosexual Christians yeah. are, uh, uh, who say they're Christians. You're saying that they're not Christians, but they might disagree with you. Sure. But so even even your minimalist definition is not enough to cover all those who describe themselves as Christians. Well, why? Yeah, so I, I guess I was sorry that I should put it to David Russell, but my, my kind of quick response retort to that is who cares? And, and this is kind of I don't I don't go by the definition of a Christian is not who calls themselves a Christian. We know that's yeah. false. The Bible itself tells us that's false because there is heretics in Paul's day and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So that's why I gave my method. And that, that's what I wanted to get your take on is my method is I let the Bible tell me, hey, this on this issue belief in the resurrection with or confess jesus as lord heaven hell or or you're saved or not if you do this or that and i limit it only to what the bible 
either explicitly or implicitly tells me you need to do this to go to heaven or hell and i don't speculate about extra stuff like well that's that's good and and, and i you know i would i i would for a long time i i would go along with that and i would um but where you say the bible i would say the new testament hmm. um um because i you know after a while i think it was around about 2012 that i gave up the trying to hold on to the idea that the old testament was the word of god but i held on to the new testament as being somehow inspired and but of course what we mean by if once we let go of inerrancy i mean i don't know if you believe that the bible is without error but if you if you let go of that assumption then you're you're sliding down a slope or along a scale as i was saying and the question is, what does it mean by inspiration? Um, where you might have errors. Um, and people have tried to say what that means, you know, that the Bible is true in all important respects, perhaps, you know, that, that where the Bible talks about doctrine or something important to salvation, that therefore it's, it's correct, if you like, it's, it's from God. Whereas details might be wrong, science might be a bit off, you know, dates might be, names might be wrong or so, but, but in essentials, it's correct. Is that your idea of inspiration? Uh, yeah, so, so I would take, uh, like as a Molinist, I would take a supervisory model of inspiration, whereby, you know, that explains the confluency of scripture, human beings wrote, um, but God as a supervisor, knew what they would write in any set of circumstances and in that way he providentially set it up to get the books that he wanted what was said in the thing so uh i'm not an inerrantist or or i'm at least i'm agnostic on it i used to say no i'm not uh an inerrantist but now i'm agnostic as to whether inerrancy could be true uh yeah. or not uh, under a certain definition of it uh, so and sorry, what did you ask me? The last part you were asking. Me. Oh, well, yeah. Um, so yeah, how we define um, inspiration here—it's a very fuzzy word, isn't it? Uh, I think uh, it's difficult to define. But um, I, I was trying to say that I think most people would say something like it's—you know—it gets things right on the important important topics, but details may um, human beings wrote it. And, you know, God kind of, as you say, supervised it. So nothing, you know, important stuff was right. They got the important stuff right. Yeah, so, so I would definitely take, I, I'm mainstream, like William yeah. Craig or Gary. But, but things like the, the name of the high priest in, uh, in, in Mark 2, 26, that could be wrong, but the Bible as a whole could still be inspired. Yeah, um, and I'm kind of a weirdo in that I say even the errors are inspired as, as well. Um, so, um, and, and I have a reason, theological reasons why I, why I argue that. But uh, uh, anyways, but nonetheless, yeah, like the, when it comes to inerrancy, um, that's really the issue you're talking about. And yes, yeah. God can, there are degrees of what, so on the essential issues, God very probably and or I would say it's probably impossible that God could allow errors on the essential doctrines or essential mm -hmm. teachings. But he could get secondary details you know is it thirty thousand yeah. horses or twenty thousand and that's yeah. less important and the, the way i kind of categorize uh those tiers as to the significance of the errors is through what i call undue confusion and i know that this is something you you brought up about how the bible's confusing sometimes mm -hmm. um so i don't think god can allow for undue confusion and and undue confusion is defined as confusion that unjustifiably hinders one from achieving their ultimate purpose achieving salvation mm. and i kind of weigh them you know okay if there's an error between twenty thousand and thirty thousand, is that really going to hinder someone unjustifiably hinder someone from achieving salvation well most people it's not that big of an issue they look past mm. it um unless they've got indoctrination that no it's it's biblical inerrancy everything has to be perfect or something like that but that's you know that's neither here nor there Whereas something like Calvinism versus Molinism, that's that's a lot more significant. I still don't think it's an essential issue, but it causes a lot more confusion. And that could, you know, it's more significant than just numbers. Mm. Um, and then in the central category is, did Jesus die or not? If Jesus uh, rise from the dead or not? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, 
um, then Christianity's false. Like it's game over for Christians. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I yeah. got to it. So you, you do accept that um, Unitarian Christians, so-called Christians are Christians if they follow your, um, follow this, this definition, they believe in the, the, that Jesus rose from the dead, they've repented of their sins, they're trying to live a holy life, that they are Christians. They don't, um, they don't believe in a trinity, they don't believe that Jesus is God, but you would accept them as Christians? I do not. So, uh, and this was kind of awkward. On, on the show with Dr. Dale Tuggy, I had to kind of say, you're, you're not really a Christian, but yeah, G at the very least, I would say that they, 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 follow your, they follow your minimal definition of being a Christian, don't they? Well, I, I didn't include, I wasn't exhaustive in, in everything. So, so let me say that also in addition to that, right? Like Jesus deity, I think I gave, there's one verse that explicitly says belief in Jesus deity is definitional. There's no verse that explicitly oh. says belief. Wait, where's that, where's that verse? Um, I was in, I quoted it in my debate with Dr. Dale Tuggy and I didn't uh, look it up. I, I think it's somewhere in Roman, oh, well, Romans, uh, Romans 10, right? Or Romans, Romans 9, 10. confessing the Lord, I think was one of them, but um, I, I don't have it offhand. I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, but it was in my debate with Dr. Dale Tuggy. Oh yeah, of course. Well, I'm, I'm sure um, Dale would have said that the word Lord there does not mean Yahweh, um, but it's just Kyrios, the Greek word is Kyrios. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, but and, and the New Testament is, is clear that, um, uh, I mean, Paul certainly he talks about God distinguishing him from the Lord Jesus. There are two different persons there, and uh, and the Lord here is that's Kyrios, but the word Lord, of course, translates Yahweh when the set when the Septuagint is being translated into Greek. So you've got this uh, amb ambiguity, haven't you, the, uh, in the word Lord, as we see it in our New Testaments. Yeah, well, I, I disagree with that. I, de I debated with Dale Tuggy. I think it does say Yahweh there. Um, and okay. it, it's saying that Jesus shares in the di divine identity, as Richard Bauckham would, would argue. But Okay, so I mean, your, your minimal, sorry, Dale, your minimal definition has been expanded now. Yeah, it's, that's the to, point. To, to, to believe that Jesus is God. Is that right or in some sense. So, okay, so first of all, it is a minimal definition. I wasn't trying to be exhaustive. I didn't list all the sins, right? Like I didn't list lying and stuff like that. If you're a person- Yeah, you, you said keep my commandments. So, you know, we can understand yeah. what that might mean. So, and outside of that, so there's repentance. There's also, um, you know, confessing that Jesus is Lord and meaning that Jesus, you have to admit Jesus is a deity. This is a make or break. I would argue that it's implied. There's no explicit verse that I was able to quote in my debate with Tuggy about the Holy Spirit's personhood and, and deity in that sense. But yeah. I think it's it could be implied, right? It, given the Bible, if the Bible teaches the Holy Spirit as a person and a divine person, well, if it's important to recognize as Jesus as deity, the second person of the Trinity, that implies it could make or break you whether you believe in the Holy Spirit okay. and, and the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. Um, like okay. Well, th thanks, Dale. Well, um, according to you, I I haven't been a Christian for the last fifteen years. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, so um, you know my 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 statement that I ceased to be a Christian last year was actually false. That I haven't been a Christian for a long time. Yeah, pre pretty much um, under my way of, of defining it there. But all right, cool. Um, so David Russell, I know that you're waiting and getting board okay so what is your answer then to this major issue of what is a christian for um david kimball cook <laughs> you know what you know what's funny is is just listening to you dale i think you covered it um i would probably uh greatly benefit from your uh debate with tuggy there i would like uh, like to hear what you said there about uh that disagreement but i think uh and this is funny is that we're, we we describe uh a disunity and here i am in unity with you dale on this aspect uh so yeah and i and yeah i i really have nothing on it i think you covered this well if you'd like to move on man i i mean yeah. i'm pretty much the same i would i would hold 
hold to those things just as you did. Uh, I do think the divinity of Christ is truly a salvific issue. Um, but the only thing nuance I would say, and I, I do want to clarify something for David is, is I'm not saying you didn't do your research. Man. <laughs> I really didn't mean it that way. And I tried to throw that caveat in saying, you know, I can't say this for sure, you know, and, I, and stuff like that, just to kind of to buttress it because I, you know, I'm not saying that you haven't done your research or anything. So I, I just want to make that clarification. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I, I know that those saying things like that, that's why I try to give the caveat, you know, uh, and buttress it with, with what I'm saying, because I know it can be taken the wrong way pretty easily. So, uh, but yeah, I, I want you to know, I, I don't say you haven't done your research. I think we disagree on, on, on it, but, uh, but yeah, as far as, as the salvation issue goes, I, I do want to throw one caveat into it is that I think that if somebody is heart is in the right place, right. As they're doing these studies and they're looking into it, right. And they just haven't landed on that, 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 that part yet, but they're seeking it with all their heart that God will reveal that to them. So they will have that choice. And um, so, yeah, I, I, Dale, I agree with all that. But I, I do think that somebody that is 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 truly seeking God and somebody that is truly saying, yeah, I believe this about Jesus. And, you know, I, I'm unsettled on this issue. I think God will reveal himself in that aspect. And I think there's scripture even that that will say that, you know, whether, you know, maybe there's angels or something. Well, I can't remember off the top of my head, so I don't want to you know, bastardize the scripture. There. <laughs> yeah. But I, I do think there will be a time where God does reveal it. So even to David, if, if you're still on that journey and you're really like, Hey, I do want to believe the truth. I think God's going to reveal that to you. Yeah. So this one, one last, it's thing. never a settled issue yeah. when it comes to that. So what, one, last I think that's where we argue from. Honestly, I think we argue from that perspective too. So, all right, cool. Yeah, one one last thing, just to kind of back up what um, David Russell was saying at the last part. There, there's a difference between defining who is saved versus where I've taken an inclusivist perspective and what is a Christian. And, you know, I, I was obviously answering this specific question. What are the definable boundaries uh, of a Christian? And I gave a, a minimal definition there. Um, so there, there could be, I think people that lack, don't meet some of these conditions under certain circumstances could be saved. I myself uh, lacked certain conditions, but I, I think that I would have been saved at certain times under certain circumstances. Well, we all know you're a heretic anyway, so. There, there we go. <laughs> See, you're not alone, David K. Don't, don't feel too bad. I get called a heretic by uh, my, Mr. Russell here all the time. but uh, yeah. uh, It's my favorite joke word to to kind of break the ice, you know, <laughs> yeah. break the seriousness. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Awesome. All so right. We're, we're winding up in a, in a couple of minutes, aren't we? Yeah. I was just yeah. about to say, like, I think yeah. that that covers that we, we can end now, unless you want it. Is there a, some other topic that you really feel is important to go? Well, to or? we've just, you know, we, we've, we've raised so many important issues, haven't we? And, um, and it, it's been it's been so much fun talking to you guys. Um, I have really enjoyed it, and you've given me food for thought. Yeah, um, the problem of evil is, is a marker there. I mean, some of you know, I, I raised these these planks that um, I found myself not to be standing on anymore. We could talk more about that. Um, okay. Sin, salvation, the goodness of God, the justice of God. The nature of God, even um, what is it to be a Christian? I think you've 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 raised the two of you have made the kind of points that are made. And, and the problem is, 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 is that, you know, there are different views, aren't there? Different views out there. Someone who goes on Romans 10, 9 will be saved. Um, and whether or not they believe that Jesus is God, unquote, or there is a Trinity, um, he will be saved according to that verse. And um, you talked about the Bible speaking. The problem I have, you see, is uh, I did believe that, but the Bible speaking, when the Bible doesn't speak with one voice, what do you do? Um, and this is what I found, even looking at the New Testament, I don't find it to be univocal on all the important things, um, like, like, um, like salvation, faith works, or both, or grace. Um, you know, a Calvinist would read, that, take certain verses out of the New Testament, 
like Ephesians 2, um, the Molinist or Arminian would take other verses as well that emphasize free will. We don't, when you start, don't see the Bible as speaking with one voice, it's then you've got problems because you rightly, Dale, started off by saying, it's the Bible, isn't it? It's the Bible. If you've got that whole holistic view of the Bible, then you're on a firm ground with your faith. But if you let go of that and start seeing the Bible as speaking with different voices, then I think you have trouble in maintaining your integrity uh, as 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 Christian. And that's the, that's where I've got. Gotcha. OK, um, so that, that makes sense. I think that's an important point to to yeah. to to um, think about concluding on is how we approach the Bible. How do we see it? Yeah, yeah. So if you're if you're kind of like so you're asking me and David Russell to kind of give our answer right now as to that or oh me um no I'm I'm saying that this is a fundamental point here and the difference between us is that you're on firm ground you two because um you're saying you're 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 treating the Bible as your foundation mm -hmm. and you you see it as uh, as speaking with one voice and as the inspiration of God. I'm saying that I, I don't see that now anymore. I see it as a collection of human documents and, I, and, I, and I've let go of this assumption that of inspiration, although there might be some kind of fuzzy inspiration in some parts that I might concede to according to some theistic idea. I haven't worked that out yet. But I, I think I, that's, that's, that's a fundamental difference which has led to my kind of feeling of disintegration in faith. I thought, so, Here's a great question to kind of close off based on what you're saying here. And I would love to come back and maybe uh, focus on like one or two specific topics and spend the whole show on like one or two, because I think I tried to tackle too much in one show here. But I, uh, so in terms of what you're saying there, this difference of perspective, obviously, you know, certain Christians, they do see the Bible as a unified whole and they, they'll see like, oh, well, there's this one verse that's talking about works in James, or there's another verse that's talking about faith alone or, or stuff like that. And we harmonize that. We recognize as Christians, Bible-believing Christians, that there's ways to harmonize that. It, both verses are correct, um, but you, there's a way to harmonize them. Whereas you, you are kind of at the point, well, no, they're contradictions. They, they're, they're speaking with two different voices. They're saying contradictory things, not just contrary, but contradictory. So, like that's correct. Yeah, that that that's correct. I mean, I, I yeah, for a long time I tried to pull them together, but yeah. So how did that? Good. How did that happen? Like it, when you were um, a, a Bible believe biblical Unitarian before? Yeah. Like at what point did that switch? That you're like, this is a contradiction. It can't be harmonized. Well, you you're um. The, when you, you, you read, say, um, you know, somebody like N.T. Wright on Paul, a great scholar of Paul, who says that for Paul, justification is by works in the end. And then you read other scholars equally versed in, in, in the New Testament who disagree violently with him. And that, then you realize that the Bible isn't speaking as a whole. If, if people who obviously devoted to Jesus, devoted to the truth um, and immensely scholarly know their stuff, disagree so violently about the basis of salvation. Yeah. And uh, so the whole spectrum of, you know, works on fact that books and books and books have been written about Paul shows to me now that Paul is not clear. Gotcha. All right, cool. All the right. The fact that you can, scholars can write so much about it. <laughs> and, and I think Paul is just inconsistent with himself. Gotcha. All right. And that's why so many books have been written about it, because, as you say, <laughs> they, they, they try to harmonize. And you could say a lot when you try to harmonize. Um, I think we'd have a bigger problem, David, if they all agreed. <laughs> 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 then I might start saying, "Hey, man, these guys are colluding and just trying to well, trick me." <laughs> they're not going to get. They're not going to get their PhDs by or their, their journal articles by saying I agree with him. <laughs> right, not, that too. You need at least you need at twenty thousand words for a thesis. <laughs> well, it depends on how. I think it would depend on how how the system what was if we grew up on a system where collaboration and and you know was a was a thing. Maybe it would be different, but it's not. So, I hear you, man.
Awesome. All right. Well, <laughs> with that said, I, I think I will close it out just to respect David Kemble's time. But yeah. Thanks for coming on, David. I had a I had a blast. Well, as I said, it's been it's been a real pleasure. And I hope we could we could do this again. Maybe narrow down on some specific topic areas. Yeah, sure. Well, like yeah, uh, anytime. What uh, what just out of curiosity before we end, like what topic? One or two topics would you guys? I'll, I'll we'll just debate discuss that. I'll get out of the way and let you guys talk on on those topics rather than trying to fit in six or something. But like one or two, what what would you guys really like to discuss with each other? Well, I mean, yeah, I'm open to anything, anything, man. So, like, I mean, you guys want to tackle anything. I, like I said, I mean, I, I, I would love to stick to David's list and, you know, just address his questions in the next round as, as well as you, Dale. I, you know, I, I enjoyed this conversation as a three-way conversation, you know, so it's, it was just a great time. Uh, yeah, David Kay, is there any anything specifically? Yes, like well, um, because I think we said both of you are moralists, is that right? You're both moralists. Yeah. And uh, the problem of evil um, and God's justice, I think. And and so it's, it's one big, big one. As, as, as we said, um, White and Craig were supposed to have been talking about that in their discussion, but they did just scratched the surface there. Um, yeah, sure. And so, so that's a big one. Um, sin and salvation. Um, it's another big one that so maybe those two we talked about the bible a lot today um we've talked about and i don't really want to go into the unitarian deity of christ thing because you've done that dale with 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 the other dale yeah <laughs> and and so um and dale tuggy holds up his end better than i could on that uh, but on those two areas so it would be very fruitful i think awesome all right cool well i'll be in touch um yeah with that said i just want to say thank you guys both for for coming on and, and uh, giving your take on both of these things. I think there's a lot of good stuff said. Um, next uh, next show that I have coming up um, will be with Dr. Paul Bali and uh, his friend, I forgot his last name, but Dr. Julian. They're going to be discussing kind of um, the COVID restrictions and vaccine mandates and all this stuff. In particular, what is that how do we grapple with that in light of religious rights and that sort of thing? And these are both non-religious uh, people. So it'll be interesting to get their take on that. So other than that, have a great week, everybody.